My name is Barry McCaffrey. I'm a reporter from Belfast. Uh, I worked on the film No Stone Unturned uh, as a researcher uh, and I'm currently on police bail with my colleague uh, Trevor Burney. I am Trevor Burney. I was a producer on the film No Stone Unturned. June 18th, 1994, uh, Ireland are playing Italy in the World Cup uh, football uh, finals uh, in New York in Shea Stadium. In, in Belfast, in Northern Ireland, in a small rural pub uh, bar, o, uh, O'Toole's Bar, 19 miles from Belfast, 15 local men have gathered, to, uh, men and women have gathered to uh, watch Ireland in this iconic football match. Nobody expected that Ireland uh, had, a, had a chance. Uh, but Ireland score. Everybody in the bar, this was like, you know, everybody was going to remember where they were that night. But unfortunately, everybody does remember where they were that night, but not for the sporting reasons. Yeah, so shortly after half time, then uh, two gunmen appeared at the bar. Uh, one of them came through into the bar dressed in a boiler suit and dropped his knee in a military style and opened fire with an automatic rifle, a VZ-58 rifle. Uh, six men died immediately. Uh, five were injured. Um, this came at a time when uh, Ireland was really full of hope, not only just about the football and the team uh, that had gone to America, but also about the peace process. And instead, um, you had one of the worst atrocities that uh, the uh, Northern Ireland had ever seen during 30 years of conflict. 25 years on, despite uh, every you know everybody trying to uh, trying to work it out, it, this was a totally random attack. Nothing had ever happened like this. This wasn't the the, the scene or the the hub of where where there were bombs and killings every day. And to this day, we don't know why the killers chose this bar. It appears that the, the certainly for the police, the chief suspects came from the area around. Uh, where the bar is located and would have known that it was going to be uh, full that night uh, with supporters of the Irish football team. It may have been chosen simply because they knew there were going to be a large number of Catholics watching a football match. The police and the, and the politicians that uh, told the families, we, we will leave no stone unturned, we will, bring the, we will catch these killers. And it took 10 long years for the families to realise that, that they had been betrayed, that they had been lied to that police were protecting uh, informers. And at that time, uh, a former Canadian Mountie, Al Hutchison, led the office uh, of the police ombudsman and he, he, he agreed to take on the case and to investigate fully. Uh, Al Hutchison later uh, retired from the office and was replaced by Dr. Michael McGuire. And over several years, he investigated until in June 2016. He brought forward a new report which um, uh, concluded that indeed there was collusion between the police and the killers. The confidence of the families were at the lowest ebb. They didn't really believe at that point that the state was prepared to give them the truth and tell them exactly what had happened. And then we very quickly realised uh, that there was indeed something much more cinematic, if you like, in this story, that there was a, a global story uh, a universal story of a state being involved in the killing of its own citizens and then subsequently covering up. So at that point uh, we went to uh, our friend and colleague in New York, Alex Gibney. There was an awful lot of work but we we're very proud of the film and we were very proud on uh, particularly on the night when we brought the film to Lock and Island and showed it to over 400 people crammed into a little local community hall and uh, a really emotional night whenever they got to see the film for the first time. This is the story of a state letting down its citizens. It's not Northern Ireland. Forget about Northern Ireland. This is about a state had a responsibility to protect its citizens and they betrayed them. So the families wanted their story. They wanted to tell their story. Every journalist or, uh, receives uh, leaked documents. Uh, you know, it's part and parcel of uh, what a journalist and what reporters do. In, in this case, we were lucky that in 2000, late 2011, uh, we received one, one of these do those documents. It contained a mountain of evidence that showed that the killers were being protected. Crucially, things like the police, uh, when the killers, when the, the, the main suspects are about to be arrested, 
a policeman phones them the night before to tip them off that they're being arrested. They certainly didn't want the families to know about it. This was this document should have been kept, uh, you know, on on a in a in a safe that nobody would ever find out. But somebody had the courage to send it. Somebody had the courage. Somebody knew that what was happening was wrong, and that the Lock and Island families, like all other families, deserve the truth. The one big key difference between Michael Maguire's report. Uh, that he produced in 2016 in the film that came out 18 months later is that the film names the suspects. Um, Dr. McGuire um, is unable to name the uh, unable to name the suspects in his report because of uh, the uh, um, the laws governing his office. So that wasn't a very easy decision. It was a decision taken over many months, involving many lawyers uh, in Northern Ireland. Um, just like in Great Britain, uh, when journalists begin to name suspects, you're treading into uh, difficult territory and it's not territory that Barry and myself are completely comfortable in. Uh, we've seen it go wrong so many times, but we felt that the mountain of evidence that Barry had managed to collate during his investigative work that we felt it was essential uh, to name the suspects and uh, we feel today that was the right decision. And this led to what happened on the 31st of August. Um, could you? Sort of both in turn, um, starting with you, Barry. Can you just tell us about the day you were arrested? What happened? It's it's a Friday. It's the thirty first of August, two thousand and eighteen. I hear a knock at the door. There was a burly policeman in a boiler suit with a gun. And he produces a search warrant and tells me that they're going to come in and search my home and that it was in relation to uh, no stone unturned. Uh, and at that stage, you. you you probably don't realise at that stage that you, that's answering the door, that's when your life changes. That's when things are never going to be the same again. I'm arrested, I'm taken to uh, a police station in, in the city centre of Belfast. Uh, we're, or I'm brought up into the what they call the serious crime suite. We're, we're, up, we're, we're up with the serious, where the murders uh, investigations happen, where the terrorists are brought. I, I have no problems with what the police done that day. I, I'm not complaining about police. Policemen were, do, were doing their jobs. That's okay. The, the superiors who ordered that you go and you search journalists' home and journalists aren't allowed to, uh, to expose wrongdoing, I have, certainly have problems with that. But the police on the day, no. Friday, August uh, 31st was to be a pretty normal day. But by the time I come down the stairs, then there were already police officers swarming through our hall and into the kitchen. And um, for a time, I thought they were there. They said something about wanting to search for materials linked to the film, No Stone Unturned. So and then I confirmed my fears that it was about the film. I was put into the back of the car and, and, and drove to a police station. Um, you know, and I remember being in the back of the car and saying to the detective, so, uh, so can you tell me that the suspects are also being arrested this morning? The people who actually murdered six men, they're being arrested. I'm sure this is all part of a wider operation, but you're actually going after the killers, aren't you? This just isn't about me or, or the film. This is about something else. And um, he didn't answer me. No one has ever been charged nor convicted. And here you had uh, police deciding in the aftermath of a documentary film not to go after the killers, but to go after the journalists over a leaked document. We were questioned for several hours on the 31st of August. Um, uh, and over the course of that time, uh, police put these four allegations to us that we had stolen a document that would hold, handle stolen goods. What was unknown to us at that stage was actually the police ombudsman who confirmed later uh, to a journalist that uh, he had not made any complaint about any stolen document. He had not uh, complained to police that a document that was under his, his, uh, uh, under his roof had been stolen and that he had made no allegation against us at all. So, you know, it gives you an insight into the, the quality and sophistication of the investigation against us and only leads you to question what exactly is this all about? What really is this all about? That the state would order the arrest of two journalists involved in a documentary that confirmed that there was collusion in the murder of its own citizens. You've got to ask yourself, why would police go to these lengths? And, and that's a question that Barry and I ask on a daily basis and unfortunately we don't have the answer to. The police are trying to prosecute us for our, our refusal to hand this document back. Uh, that's, what the offic that's what we now know that the Official Secrets Act is about. It's not about protecting citizens. It's not about saving people's lives. It's about hiding the state secrets. 
But it's not for the good of you, it's not for the good of me. It's to protect killers. And we don't believe that that's what it should. We believe that it's being abused and it's being misused. Six months before the film premiered, Trevor and other uh, producers went to police and said to police, this is, this is what we're going to do. These are the suspects that we're going to name. And if there is a problem, if police need to do something, you have the time to do it. But police didn't take this opportunity. They didn't do anything. They sat on their hands. They didn't fulfil the, uh, their obligations, their, their moral and legal obligations that they, should, that they should have done. Yeah, we had worked with the Ombudsman's Office for uh, a number of years on this film. Throughout the period before the Ombudsman, it was absolutely clear about two things, and that is that um, we were always going to name the suspects. Uh, where that was our intention and that we understood that he had a statutory obligation that whatever he discovered whatever we told him in meetings it was his obligation to tell that to police what police are saying is that we breached the official secrets act and therefore caused harm and the harm that they're saying we caused is that we uh, increased the risk to the lives of the suspects by naming them However, you know, we had sent letters to the, each of the of the suspects alerting them several months before the film uh, come out that they were going to do that and they didn't respond. So despite all of that, despite all the information the police knew, you again you've got to come back to the question, why arrest us? Why put us through this? Why put our families and friends and colleagues through this? You've got to ask that question about what exactly is this all about in Northern Ireland today? And, and, and I think that this is really an affront to journalism. It is an attack on the freedom of the press. During police questioning, it's put to us do we not feel uh, shame, uh, the hurt and the pain that we have caused the killer? So police, a policeman with a straight face sits across the table and asks me, uh, are you not ashamed of the hurt and the pain that you have caused this man who supposedly killed eight people? Uh, and they don't want the public to know that instead of the police going and trying to catch the killer and questioning this man about the murder of eight people, they go to him and they say, what, what did you think of this film? Did you, do you, do, did you like this film? Uh, do you think it caused you reputational damage? Would you like us to, to arrest the journalists? And that's what they did. You cannot have uh, a law that's given journalists the freedom of expression, whereas, Article, uh, or, whereas the Official Secrets Act is basically preventing journalists from um, putting into the public domain information, in this case, about the state being involved in the collusion and cover-up of the murder of its own citizens. On the day of our arrest, uh, we were held for 14 hours and uh, uh, police then decided that they would release us, but only on the basis that we were prepared to come back for questioning, for further questioning. So we're now on bail and we're going to be on bail uh, for over 12 months uh, since our arrest. And, and part of the conditions of that bail are that we have to uh, we have to alert police uh, three days before we, we, we want to leave the jurisdiction. So if Barry and I want to get on a train to take uh, the train from Belfast to Dublin, we have to call police three days ahead of time and, and alert them of our intentions. This is a completely ridiculous stipulation. It means absolutely nothing. People should realise just exactly where we are now. This is an attack on the press. It isn't about us. It is an attack on does the Official Secrets Act uh, supersede the right to a free press? Does, does a policeman or a politician in some obscure room, does he decide what the public get to know? Do, do editors, do newspapers, do filmmakers, do they have a right to expose wrongdoing? Well, if we lose this case, no, they don't. Because some bureaucrat Will, will decide what the public needs to know. And that's where, that's where we are. Ask yourself who is asking you not to trust the media. Ask yourself why, they're at, why they don't want uh, the public to trust the media. And they, they, listen, they, there, there are good reporters, there are bad reporters, there are good filmmakers, there are bad filmmakers. But the public have to have faith that they, they, they have to get their information from somewhere. They have to be able to trust uh, that there is a good, a free and an independent press out there that they can rely on, that can bring them the stories that matter. When you think of a dictatorship, the first thing you go for 
is the media. The first thing you go for is, is the press. Are we, are we living in a dangerous period uh, for reporters and, and for press freedom? Yes, yes, I, I think it's, it's, it, it's certainly the most dangerous uh, time in, in my lifetime. Make no mistake, if, if it's us today, tomorrow, it, it'll be somebody else. But, you know, there only have been uh, a number of occasions when journalists have, have been arrested. And uh, I think that if you asked many of our colleagues back home, they would have told you that those days are, are gone. And there is something highly ironic about the fact that uh, the British Foreign Office has deemed 2019 to be a year of media freedom around the world. We've seen Jeremy Hunt go off to other countries to extol the virtues of the freedom of the press. And yet here in his own backyard, you have an English police force going after journalists. And it's no wonder that the NUJ have, have, have described this as the, the most serious attack on the freedom of the press here in, in, in GB because we, we understand that, we get it. And uh, it's just unfortunate that uh, it's the two of us caught up in the, in the storm of it. If you uh, were to ask the families of the six men who died in Lockett Island today uh, what they have achieved, they will say truth. They will say that the, the report from Dr. Michael McGuire in June 2016 and the film helped them come to a, an understanding of the truth of what happened to their families. And the key thing is that police were involved in the collusion uh, that led to the death of uh, their loved ones and the cover up afterwards. And that truth comes from the work of people like Barry McCaffrey. That truth can only come from the work of investigative journalists working um, on these types of stories. That's why this is such an egregious attack and that's why it's so worrying and so, um, uh, and has raised so many questions. Once the police watched the film, they had a choice. They could have investigated the allegations and they could have potentially brought truth and brought justice to the families, but they didn't. I think that's where they have, they, they, they have seriously let themselves down. All I can say is that Barry and I are determined to do whatever is needed in order to protect um, uh, the importance of the journalism that um, that we do. Um, are we hopeful? I think that um, it's far too early to say. I think that unfortunately this case is going to rumble on for many months uh, yet. Uh, we're not really going to know um, what's going to happen in terms of the criminal investigation into us for for many months, if not years, and um, I think that's, that's, that's what the police want to do. They want to leave this hanging over us. What will be, will be. Uh, it's not in our hands. We can't control it. Will we see it through to the end? Yes, definitely. Will we defend press freedom against the official secret sector? We'll take it to the end.